Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. Urban legends. And strange places. If you'd like to support our show and get extra content plus early and ad-free episodes, go ahead and sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash palmahawkmedia. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K media. And be sure to check out our website at paradiseafterdark.com. On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, our mailing list, merch store, links to our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. And at the website, we also have a cool little tip jar there. So if you just want to help out the show, you can drop in a couple coins and then uh, we'll give you a shout out. Yes. And just a reminder that Lauren and Jay, Jay and I, will be at CrimeCon UK June 10th and 11th in London, England. You can get your ticket at crimecon.co.uk and use code PARADISE for 10% off. And... Paradise After Dark is officially going to be at CrimeCon in Orlando this year. Florida podcast, Florida location. September 22nd through the 24th. You can get your ticket at CrimeCon.com slash CC23. And again, use code PARADISE for 10% off. Yes, that would be pretty cool. I would love to see some people come to CrimeCon. If you if you haven't been to one and you're in Florida, this is the time to go because I think it'll probably go back out west again. Who knows? Because we well, last year was what Vegas, yes, and Austin. So it's either up north or out west. So <laughs> this is your chance. This is your chance. But to this shine. is Florida. <laughs> this is our time to shine. Exactly. Remember, <laughs> we were actually invited to Orlando in um, 2020 originally, but... but of course, you know, we don't have to tell you about 2020 because <laughs> everyone knows what happened there. So anyway, uh, I do want to give a cool little shout out. It's kind of cool because remember we met Trish at Publix. Yes. Well, I was at Publix the other day. And I get ran into by a fan and she recognized me. I don't know how. She says, I don't know how I recognize you. I don't know. Maybe she heard me talking to somebody because I was speaking to somebody. But Paige, thank you for listening. She says she's been a fan since day one, kind of. Thank so you, So way Paige. back when. So it was great to meet her. Great to talk to her. So thank you. We really appreciate the support. Awesome. All right. So we're going to get into a sort of controversial case. Very controversial. But I, I think it's a great case, and I'll, I'll be honest. I knew of this case, but I didn't know so much was connected to this particular case. Yes, this is actually a, an extremely important case in actually shaping parts of our, our our culture and our nation. Yeah, how our communities come together. Exactly. So we're going to be talking about the murder of Emmett Till. Emmett Lewis Till was born July 25th, 1941 in Chicago, Illinois, and died on August 28th, 1955 in Money, Mississippi at the age of 14. Emmett was born to Mamie Elizabeth Carthen and Lewis Till. Mamie was born in a small town near Webb, Mississippi, the only child of John and Alma Carthen. Ironically, she was born just two miles from the town of Sumner, where the trial for her son's killers would be held. Her father wanted to leave the South and the cotton fields and made plans soon after his daughter was born. He found work in a small industrial town of Argo, Illinois, near Chicago, at the Argo Corn Products Refining Company. When Mamie was 13, her parents divorced. Devastated, she threw herself into her schoolwork and excelled in her studies. Mamie was the first African-American student to make the A honor roll and only the fourth African-American student to graduate from a predominantly white Argo community high school. Emmett's father, Louis Till, grew up an orphan in New Madrid, Missouri. And at the age of 17, he too moved to the Chicago area and began working at the Argo Corn Company. He soon met and started seeing Mamie. And they were both 17 at the time. And Mamie and Lewis married not long after when they were both just 18 years old. So very young, and they'd only been together maybe less than a year. Now, their only child, Emmett, was born nine months later. There was no marital bliss in their home. It was not all put together. It wasn't just uh, butterflies and roses. And the couple separated in 1942 after Mamie found out that Lewis had been unfaithful to her. And Lewis 
later gets violent and he choked her close to unconsciousness to which she responded by throwing scalding hot water at him. That's what I'm saying. It was not a very good time yeah. in the house. Now, eventually, Mamie, being smart, she obtained a restraining order against Lewis, which he, of course, violated repeatedly. And finally, a judge forced him to choose between enlistment in the army or jail time. So, of course, Lewis chose the army and was shipped off to France in 1943, and this being, of course, during World War I. So, while in France, Lewis was arrested by the military police and charged along with another soldier, of murdering an Italian woman and sexually assaulting two others. He was tried and convicted and sentenced to death by hanging. The sentence was carried out at the U.S. Army Disciplinary Training Center north of Pisa, Italy, on July 2, 1945. Mamie then received a letter from the War Department that her husband had been executed due to willful misconduct. Her attempts to learn more were comprehensively blocked by the United States bureaucracy. The full details of Lewis Till's criminal charges and execution emerged only 10 years later. So she had no idea what exactly happened to Emmett's father. No. And then, of course, finds out later on that it was probably the best thing she could have ever done was get that restraining order and get him out of her life. Yes. Well, by the early 1950s, Mamie and Emmett, they moved to Chicago's south side. And while raising Emmett as a single mother, Mamie worked these long hours for the Air Force as a clerk in charge of secret and confidential files. And while his mother worked long hours, Emmett took care of almost everything else. He did laundry, he kept the house clean, and most nights he even cooked dinner. And his family remembers him as a fun-loving, gentle person who loved practical jokes and making others laugh. So he was kind of a bit of a clown, but when it came time to get things done, Emmett was always there for the family. Yeah, so he was he was an all-around good kid. In August 1955, Emmett's great-uncle, Moses Wright, came up from Mississippi to visit the family in Chicago. At the end of his stay, Wright was planning to take Emmett's cousin, Wheeler Parker, back to Mississippi with him to visit relatives down south. And when Emmett learned of these plans, he begged and begged his mother to let him go. She finally relented and put her son on a train headed south. Mamie would never see her son alive again. Growing up in Chicago and attending a segregated school, Emmett was well aware of the racism in our country at the time, but he was not quite prepared for what it would be like in Mississippi. His mother warned him before he left to take extra precautions because of his race. In the Deep South, there were certain social protocols that were to be followed. Black people were supposed to speak to white people with their eyes turned to the ground and to address them with the utmost respect. Sadly, violations were often answered with... Um, beatings, and other uses of force. You got to keep in mind, this is, this is the 1950s and it's the South, yeah. which is exactly why Mamie's father wanted to get out of the South and move to Chicago because Chicago was more open and not just Chicago, but a lot of other areas, you know, in the North, um, they were open for, you know, for people to just be people. Yeah. Whereas the South, they wanted workers, they wanted farmers. And that's unfortunately what you're kind of faced with in this area. On August 24th, 1955, three days after Emmett arrived in Mississippi, he and a group of teenagers entered Bryant's grocery store and meat market to buy refreshments after a long day picking cotton in the hot afternoon sun. What exactly transpired inside the grocery store that afternoon will never be known. Emmett purchased bubble gum, and some of the kids with him would later report that he either whistled at, flirted with, or touched the hand of the store's white female clerk, the wife of the owner of the grocery store, Carolyn Bryant. Most accounts of this day say that Emmett just whistled and may have said, bye baby, as he walked out of the store. Carolyn Bryant, the woman behind the counter, later claimed that he grabbed her and made lewd advances while whistling at her. 
Either way, whatever Emmett did that day was an apparent violation of some unwritten rule on how black males were supposed to interact with white females in the Jim Crow era in the South. Now, this grocery store had a usual flow of black customers as they did much of their business with the local sharecroppers. Roy Bryant, this is Carolyn's husband and the owner of the store where the incident occurred, he finds this information out and he's enraged about what had occurred. Now, over the next three days, Roy Bryant terrorized two other black teenagers, mistaking them for Emmett Till. One in the Bryant store and another one actually was just walking in the road who was thrown in the back of Bryant's van before he was released once he realized it was not the person that was in the store that day that he assumed whistled at his wife. On August 28th, 1955, at around 2.30 a.m., Roy Bryant and his half-brother, J.W. Millam, showed up at the home of Emmett's great-uncle, Moses Wright, and demanded to see Emmett, or the boy who had done the talking at the grocery store. Now, despite pleas from his great-uncle, Moses, the two men actually kidnapped Emmett, forced him into the car, and took off. And the kidnapping was witnessed by Moses and two of Emmett's cousins. The next day, LaFleur County Sheriff's Department arrested both Bryant and Millam and charged them with kidnapping. They admitted to taking Emmett Till, but claimed they released him. Three days later, Emmett's body was recovered, but was so disfigured that Moses Wright could only identify it by a ring he wore with his initials on it. His father's initials, actually. It was a ring from his father. It was the only thing that he had left from his father. Oh, I didn't know that. Bryant and Millam had actually made Emmett carry a 75-pound cotton gin fan to the bank of the Tallahatchie River and ordered him to take off his clothes. There they brutally beat him, gouged out his eye, shot him in the head, and then threw his body, tied to the cotton gin fan with barbed wire, into the river. That... It's absolutely just horrific. Yes. You can't. Horrifying. Yeah, you I just can't even fathom how that actually goes. I mean, I can't. Anyway, I, I don't know. Now, authorities in Mississippi worked quickly to try and have Emmett buried. But Mamie was not having any of that and demanded that her son's remains be shipped back to Chicago. Remember, she hadn't seen her son. Her son left, and then she finds out that her son has been found murdered. Yeah. Or dead, rather. However, as she found out, but mm-hmm. yet she's like, no, I want my son back, just like any parent would be. Now, her son's casket, of course, was sent back and it arrived in Chicago, locked with the seal of the state of Mississippi, but Mamie Till fought for the undertaker to open it. Now, once she saw her son, she made a monumental decision to have an open casket funeral. She famously told the funeral director, let the people see what I've seen. Mamie let Emmett's body be displayed for five days at Robert's Temple Church of God. Her reasoning for this was she wanted everyone to see the evidence of this brutal hate crime. Now, According to an article about Emmett Till on History.com, Mamie said that despite the enormous pain it caused her to see her son's dead body on display, she opted for an open casket funeral to let the world see what has happened because there's no way I could describe this and I needed somebody to help me tell what it was like. Now, tens of thousands of people came to see him at Till's body. This was about the time that the national media caught wind of this story and what had happened to Emmett. Let's take a quick break. Simeon Booker, a journalist with Jet Magazine, attended Emmett's funeral with a photographer, David Jackson, who took the now-famous image of Emmett Till in his coffin. Mamie's brave gesture represents one of the most decisive moments in the civil rights movement. The publication of the photograph in Jet and other black periodicals helped transform the modern movement, inspired a new generation of African-American activists to join the cause. It also affirmed the capacity of visual images to jolt Americans, black and white, out of their state of denial or complacency. By the time the trial for Roy Bryant and J.W. Millam had commenced on September 19, 1955, this is only like a little over a month maybe after the murder, Emmett Till's murder had become a source of outrage and indignation throughout much of the country. 
If you get a chance, I, I don't know if we want to post that image on our social media or anything, but if if, if our listeners get a chance, um, I'm po- I'm posting. You're it. gonna post it, yep. okay? It, it's it's definitely a monumental it, photograph. It's disturbing <laughs> for sure, but that's what Mamie Mamie Till wanted. She wanted the world to see it, so yes. we're gonna show it. Well, unfortunately, at the time, African Americans and women were not allowed to serve on a jury. So, of course, Bryant and Millam had an, an all-male, all-white jury. So they go to court. Now, Moses Wright took the stand at trial and identified Bryant and Millam as the men who he witnessed kidnap Emmett. Remember, they told the sheriff that they did, but they released him. Yes. So this is no small thing. Now, I'm sure those present gasped as it was almost completely unheard of during the time for a black man to openly accuse a white man of anything, especially in a courtroom. Now, a black teen named Willie Reed risked his life to testify that he saw the men drive Emmett to a farm where Reed heard them beat him mercilessly in the barn. Now, this would have been on the way to the Tallahatchie River that Lauren mentioned earlier that he was found in. Despite the overwhelming evidence of Bryant and Millam's guilt, after deliberating for a whopping 67 minutes, the jury acquitted the two men, explaining that they believed the state had failed to prove the identity of the body. One juror told a reporter that they wouldn't have taken so long, but they had, quote, stopped to drink a pop. In November, the brothers also escaped kidnapping charges when the prosecution decided it wasn't worth the trouble to charge them. So they were acquitted of the murder charges, and then they didn't even charge them with kidnapping. So many people around the country were outraged by this decision and also by the state's decision not to indict them on separate charges for kidnapping. Only a few months later, in January 1956, Bryant and Millam admitted to committing the crime. Get here, Listen to that. They admitted to committing the crime. Protected by double jeopardy laws, they told the whole story of how they kidnapped and killed Emmett Till to Look Magazine for a whopping $4,000. But Emmett Till was just one of many black men, women, and children who were murdered or lynched without recourse in the century after the Civil War. Now, the definition of lynching, which doesn't necessarily mean hanging, a lynching is defined as a form of violence in which a mob or individual, under the pretext of administering justice without trial, executes a presumed offender, often after inflicting torture or corporal mutilation. Now, Emmett's murder just happened to be one that woke this country up. Now, his horrific murder inspired what was later dubbed the, quote, Emmett Till generation by a woman named Dory Ladner. Now, she was a Southern black youth who joined meetings, sit-ins, and marches to demand their equal treatment under the law. According to an article in National Geographic, Emmett's murder also inspired the leaders of the movement. Now, 100 days after Emmett's murder, Rosa Parks sat in front of the Montgomery bus and refused to get up as it filled with white passengers. Now, this violated Alabama's bus segregation laws, but do you think Rosa cared? No. Now, Reverend Jesse Jackson said in 1988 that Rosa thought about going to the back of the bus, but then she thought about Emmett Till and said she just couldn't do it. Now, Martin Luther King Jr., one of the most prominent leaders of the civil rights movement, also invoked Till's case in several speeches. He delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech on the anniversary of Till's murder at the 1963 March on Washington. African-American children and teenagers, particularly those in the South, were shocked by the photographs in Jet magazine and the outcome of the trial. As they should have been. According to an article from the Library of Congress about Emmett's murder, sisters Joyce and Dory Ladner, who grew up in Mississippi, Remember keeping a scrapbook of every article about Emmett and their fear that their brothers could be killed too. Dory Ladner was inspired to learn more about the law after Bryant and Millam were acquitted. That's where the light bulb went off. Why aren't they being punished? And that's when I went on my quest to try and understand the whole legal system and equal rights and justice under the law. Joyce Ladner discussed how she coined the term Emmett Till Generation which she used to describe the African-American baby boomers in the South who were inspired by Till's murder to join the burgeoning movement of mass meetings, sit-ins, and marches to demand their equal treatment under the law. 
Cleveland Sellers was 11 years old when he learned about Emmett Till through Jet Magazine. He remembers, I was devastated by the fact that Emmett could have been me or any other black kid around the same age. And so I related to that very quickly. And we had discussions in our class about Emmett Till. I had a cover of the Jet and took it to school. Some other students had the same thing. And so we had rational discussions about it. And you know, the question comes up, how do you address that? And I think for us, it was projected out. And that would be our destiny to try and find remedies to a society that would allow that to happen, would condone that, and would actually free those who were responsible for that murder. And I think that that was a way in which we actually got away from revenge and hatred and those kinds of things. We talked about how we were going to use Emmett Till to build on and that we would rectify in our work and in our effort the dastardly tragedy that happened to Emmett Till. So as much as Emmett himself, the victim, obviously, is central to this story because he is ultimately the victim. His mother, Mamie, is just as important for what she did at the time of the crime and afterward, which, of course, changed and shaped a lot of different things in our country. Now, when Mamie Till learned that her son was kidnapped, she gathered her family and called up newspapers the same exact day. Now, by the next morning, she had gotten the NAACP and local and state politicians involved. Now, this early publicity proved to be very critical. After her son Emmett's murder, it became quickly evident that Mamie was an effective public speaker, and she was pissed, yeah. rightly so. The NAACP actually hired her to go on speaking tour around the country and share Emmett's story, and it was one of the most successful fundraising tours in all of NAACP history. Now, Mamie actually visited 33 cities in 19 states in one month. Now, remember, this is 1955. This is not... This is not fly here, fly there. I mean, they were literally in motorcades and they were cutting across the country. Yeah. This is a lot of stuff happening. This is a lot to take in in a month. But when the NAACP arranged for a second tour, Mamie asked for more money because she said, hey, I can't work and I got to travel. I can't do all this at the same time. I've, I've got bills. I've got to live. So she was actually accused by the NAACP executive director of taking advantage of the situation. That's just not Mamie. She's well, I don't think no. she was taking care of, or taking advantage of the situation at all. So she actually sent a letter apologizing, stating that she was not an activist. She was just a mother wanting to help the cause. And in fact, that's what she was. She wasn't trying to stand up for everything. She didn't realize how big this had gotten. But she realized what she was doing. She was molding something for the future. Right. Now Mamie was ready to go. Um, she wanted to go on the second tour and she just needed some help, a little bit more money, maybe pay for some more bills and the travel expenses. But the NAACP said no. They didn't matter. Her actions had already contributed to the growing civil rights movement. She created the proverbial snowball that just kept growing. Well, Emmett Till's death became symbolic of the lynchings of the mid-1950s. And Mamie used her position as Emmett's mother to relate to others and gain support for the cause of racial justice. Mamie earned a degree from Chicago Teachers College, later Chicago State University, in 1960. In 1976, she graduated from Loyola University in Chicago with a master's degree in administration. She advocated for children living in poverty for over 40 years, including 23 years teaching in the Chicago public school system. Her work inspired the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act in 2022, which made lynchings a federal hate crime, punishable by up to 30 years in prison. Can I just say something? It wasn't until 2022 that lynchings became a federal hate crime. Mm -hmm. That's kind of sad. Yes. Despite this bill passing both the chambers of Congress with virtually no opposition, it took more than 200 different attempts since 1900 to codify anti-lynching legislation. So Mamie Till has never been one to sit and accept the circumstances that she has been dealt. Now, amongst being the cornerstone to movements created by others, she also established the Emmett Till Players, now, this is a theater group that worked with school children outside of the classroom. 
learning and performing famous speeches by civil rights leaders such as Martin Luther King Jr. And, and they did this to sort of inspire hope, unity, and determination to the audiences. Now, Mamie founded and chaired the Emmett Till Justice Campaign. The campaign group eventually succeeded in getting and acted into law the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act of 2008 which allows cold cases of suspected violent crimes committed against African Americans before 1970 to be reopened, and the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crimes Reauthorization Act of 2016. This includes amendments to the original bill to include people of diverse backgrounds, not just African Americans. So she's just getting everybody – basically, it's just a whole envelope of – People, So she even herself realized that she was focusing so much on the civil rights of African-Americans that there are so many other people who could use some help too. So she's yeah. really pushing, you know, to get communities to come, you know, out and realize that there's some, there's some really shitty things happening here. Congress awarded Mamie Till and Emmett Till a posthumous congressional gold medal in 2022 to be put on display at the National Museum of African American History. In 2023, a statue of Mamie Till in a plaza dedicated to her is planned to be unveiled in front of the Argo Community High School, where she graduated as an honor student in Summit, Illinois. She co-authored with Christopher Benson her memoir, Death of Innocence, The Story of the Hate Crime That Changed America, which was released a few months after her death in 2003. Now, Emmett Till's death made other impacts, not just by his mother's doing. In 1987, PBS released a documentary, Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights Movement. This reignited Emmett's story and paved the way for more documentaries and books. The Emmett Till Legacy Foundation, founded in 2005, is a nonprofit organization committed to preserve the memory and legacy of Emmett Till and his mother Mamie's hope for justice that his death will not be in vain. The Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley Institute is a nonprofit organization engaged in education, research, and social justice advocacy. Their focus is on funding research, education, and public programs aimed at encouraging enlightened participation in the democratic process and working to build and maintain a civil society. Well, I, I haven't watched this yet and it's on my list. And I think after recording this, I can finally go watch it. I don't like movies to sort of influence anything that I learn or research when we're doing or covering a case, the movie till now this was released in 2022, which is based on Mamie and her life as an educator an activist who pursued justice after the murder of her 14-year-old son that we discussed, until had its world premiere at the New York Film Festival on October 1st, 2022. It was theatrically released in the United States on October 14th of 2022 by United Artists Releasing and was released in the United Kingdom on January 6th, 2023 by Universal Pictures. Till was named one of the best films of 2022 by the National Board of Review – and I'm actually very interested in watching this. Knowing what I know now, I, I, I really want to see this movie. Yeah, we're going to – we'll watch it. Yeah, if you haven't, definitely put it in your list on Netflix. Let's take another quick break. Okay, and we're back. In October of 2022, the Mississippi community of Greenwood erected a towering statue in honor of Emmett Till. The memorial statue stands nine feet tall, a bronze figure reminiscent of Till's infamous portrait with a white button-down shirt, slacks, and his left hand tipping his hat with a slight grin on his face. I feel that when young people ask me what the memory of Emmett Till is, we have this statue as a memory, Mississippi State Senator David Jordan, who represents Greenwood, told ABC News. He liberated all black people for all that he sacrificed. This is a great day, and we take another leap forward in recognizing the life and legacy of Emmett Till, the Reverend Wheeler Parker Jr., Till's only remaining family member who saw his cousin that night. He was kidnapped, told ABC News. And further, Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth has introduced legislation to designate the Roberts Temple Church where Emmett's funeral was held as a national monument. 
And Senator Dick Durbin, Cory Booker, Cindy Hyde-Smith, and Roger Wicker joined Duckworth in introducing the bill. Now, the Roberts Temple Church is of both extraordinary and incredibly heartbreaking historic importance to Chicago, our state, and to this country. And what happened to Emmett matters both during Black History Month and each day of the year, Duckworth told the Hall. By designating this church as a national monument, we will help ensure that generations of Americans can come show respect to Mamie and Emmett's stories. It's past time we recognize how national monuments can not only teach us about our history, but provoke us to build more just future. The U.S. Justice Department announced in December 2021 that it had ended its latest investigation into the lynching of Emmett Till without bringing charges against anyone. But in a federal lawsuit filed in early February of this year, Emmett's cousin, Patricia Sterling of Jackson, Mississippi, is demanding that LaFleur County Sheriff Ricky Banks serve an arrest warrant from 1955 on Carolyn Bryant Dunham for her role in the death of Emmett Till. Now remember, Carolyn was the one who started this whole thing by accusing Emmett of whistling at her. It was Carolyn Bryant's lie that sent Roy Bryant and J.W. Millam into a rage, which resulted in the mutilation of Emmett Till's body into a unrecognizable condition, the newly filed lawsuit states. In 2007, a Mississippi grand jury declined to indict Carolyn on any charges. Last year, a five-member search group, including members of Emmett's family, found an unserved 1955 arrest warrant for Bryant at the LaFleur County Courthouse. The LaFleur County Sheriff is complicit in the trio's escape from justice, even though both Roy Bryant and J.W. Millam admitted to the crime, the lawsuit continued. To this day, the warrant issued for Carolyn Bryant remains unserved. Carolyn Bryant's whereabouts are known. This action is being brought in order to compel the LaFleur County Sheriff to serve the warrant upon Carolyn Bryant, it added. We are using the available means at our disposal to try and achieve justice on behalf of the Till family, Sterling's attorney, Trent Walker, told the Associated Press. So, a couple things I'd like to discuss here, Lauren. Okay. Okay. I, I guess, you know, the, the, the problem that you had in this town was this was – we talked about small town America. We're, we're, we can call this Ken's Corner. Ken's Corner. Ken's Corner. So – Small town USA. But the problem is, is that obviously the prosecution faced so many hurdles in this case. They um, faced a town that was scared to support a black man at this time, you know, because the, the, the whites and the blacks in this particular community, they were, they were segregated. They weren't together in the schools. I mean, everything was segregated in the South. It, it hadn't caught up yet. So, if you look back at this time and you actually – if you dig into this case, you'll find that the sheriff in this town was so biased and he ran this town. He was so powerful. He actually forced everyone in the courtroom to be segregated. The black reporters had to stand along the walls and then the courtroom was not going to be integrated. He actually announced on national television that I'm not going to – we're not – I mean because it was such big news. He said when you come to the courtroom, you got – the blacks are going to sit here. The whites are going to sit here. They would. He would not allow any intermingling whatsoever. Only people, the only reporters and the news people, the media that were allowed to sit were the white media in this town. So the prosecution faced this giant hurdle of trying to prosecute these white folks in this town, and they were looking at a black man and saying, "This man." was murdered by these white people. We have to do something about it. So a lot of people – and I actually got into discussion with somebody the other day, and I was trying to explain to him the situation, and he made a good point. He said, well, obviously, if the prosecutor and the investigators and so many other people were whites, they were trying to go after, and they were trying to make a difference in this community, but they, they, they hit so many, so many hurdles and so many dead ends. And as a matter of fact, You look at Moses Wright. Now, Moses Wright was the uncle who Emmett Till – he was staying with Emmett Till. Yeah. So Emmett Till was staying with him. I apologize. Right. I'm going backwards. So these guys break in and go to kidnap him. And one of the things that was said 
by Brian is he said, how old are you? And he said, like, 64. I'm 64 years old. He says, well, if you say anything about this, you won't live to see 65. So he was verbally and physically threatened by Bryant about coming and getting involved in this, saying anything to anyone. So he goes and testifies. So he goes to the courthouse and he testifies, obviously, for his his, his great nephew, because he's the great uncle, right. on Till's behalf. He was so scared that he goes back, packs up some stuff, and leaves everything behind and moves to Chicago. That's how scary it was in this town. So it wasn't just that you know the people were so racist. They were in fear of the sheriff, of the law in this town because they were so racist. So you had this small group of powerful people within this town that and, – and obviously probably within a lot of towns in that community in that time that people were so scared. Um, the other gentleman, um, I can't think of his name at this moment. The other gentleman that, that came, there was a few other people that they found to testify against, uh, basically on Emmett Till's behalf. And they left town. I mean, literally the, the one other, the one other black man that basically went on trial and he was saying what he saw that night, what he witnessed that night, because he saw these men come in and he witnessed the entire thing. He physically moved out of town and changed his name. That's how scared he was. So I think there was so many, so many things that Mamie did to basically change this outlook, to change the fear in these small towns. Because can you imagine living in this community where you got to get up and go to work every day? There's no way you could stand up for a black man in this town and, and have to face the wrath of people. I mean, you saw, you've seen the videos, you know, when they were trying to, you know, integrate the schools of how people were acting and behaving yes, at this time. Yeah. And it's it's scary. It's fearful. It's a very saddening time in our country. But obviously, little incidents like this, as sad as they are, they allow us to grow and get better. And thanks to Mamie for going forth with this. I mean, it takes guts to say, send my son here. Open this casket. Yes. I want to see him. I can't um, even. I want to put him on display. I don't want him buried right away. I want people to see this. That had to be horrific for her. Absolutely. And so, but she was willing to do that and, and go out and say that. But I, I think there was so much, so much fear in this town that I think that's where the, I, I think even the jurors, you know, came in and they were scared to death to say anything other than these guys are innocent, you know, and then later for these guys, get this. Now, here's the, I'm not going to say that this is good, but after Bryant and Millam, they go to look and they tell their story about how they indeed murdered Emmett. The townsfolk at this point, they're not pleased. They're very upset, very, very upset, and they're pissed because it's like, hey, we supported you. We said these men didn't do this. Even though they did admit to the sheriff that they kidnapped Emmett, they said they released him, right? But again, no, nothing happens, but then they go on later and say, yeah, we killed him, but they can't get us because of double jeopardy. Now, the people that invested in the defense, I mean, they gave money to the Bryant family and the Millen family and supported their – they, they supported them. They felt betrayed. And so, of course, they started to avoid them. Now, the blacks stopped frequenting the grocery stores, which was predominantly frequented by the black sharecroppers. Now, Bryant and Millam both owned stores, so they stopped supporting them completely. And so, of course, the stores go out of business. Now, because of their reputation, they were unable to find work. So Roy, he decides he's going to take his family. He moves to East Texas. So he takes takes a welding. He goes from welding school. Now, his half-brother, Millam, that's obviously the other douchebag in this case. He follows him soon after. Now, years later, both men decided, you know what, we're going to return back to Mississippi. They didn't go back to money, Mississippi. So Millam, um, he owned no land at all, and he couldn't get a loan or anything else. He could not do anything in Mississippi, but he was actually able to rent 217 acres in what they call Sunflower County. So he, he starts growing cotton, but – all of the black men were like, we're not working for you. The black workers who basically built the cotton industry, they built the communities there. People didn't realize that they were sort of the backbone of the community of what was going on there. Um, they, and obviously when you look back, now you see it. But they wouldn't work for him. So he was forced to actually hire a lot of the white workers. But they wanted like four times the pay. So they basically ran him in the ground. And it was actually witnessed um, 
I forget what it was on Valentine. Yeah, I'm, here it was. I knew I found the article on Valentine's Day in 1958. He was seen Millam standing in a bread line waiting to receive wa- rations from the welfare department. Now this is according to the New York Post. So basically, he comes back. He tries to get back into being this big hot shot store owner, landowner. You know, he he borrows all this money. And of course, he basically falls apart because nobody wants to work with him. That's how that because his reputation was shot. Thank God. It's like karma got you in the ass and you deserve revenge. I was just going to say karma's a bitch. Exactly. So now here you are with your hand out in line. Basically, now you're the epitome of poverty. Good for you. Now, Bryant, this guy, now he's going to have run ins with the law. Um, he comes back, he tries to open a grocery store, which he does. So later on, he actually two times. He gets involved in what they call food stamp fraud. So he was basically have people come in and they would sell him food stamps at a lesser price. So you go in, you give him a you give him a ten dollar food stamp, he gives you five bucks. But then he turns around and basically sells it to the government for full value. Right? So he gives you five dollars cash, you go out the door. Basically, he takes it and turns it in for ten dollars. So basically that's illegal. You couldn't do that. And obviously in a community of full of poor people, they wanted cash. So in 1981, Millam, he dies of bone cancer, which from what I understand is pretty nasty. So after standing in line getting bread, he dies of a pretty nasty death. Now, Roy Bryant, he died 13 years later after Millam passed away of some unknown cancer. So I think karma kind of bites these guys in the ass. I mean, this is what happens to these guys. They, they went on to try to do other things and they couldn't. And I'm not going to say I feel sorry for him at all. I'm not going to say that – um they didn't deserve everything that happened to them, but you know when when they went in front of the community and said, "Hey, we did do this," you know, thank you all for supporting us, but we lied, and um, you know, sorry guys. Everybody's like, "Get the hell out of here!" So I, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, but you know, I just I, I feel horrible, but unfortunately, that was how things were at the time, and obviously, it's grown, you know, to it's getting better. I mean, I think it takes it takes events like this, and it takes certain people to push forth, and like Mamie did, and make it a better society for people to enjoy um, the cultures of everyone. You know, I think everyone deserves a stand. I think everyone deserves a say. And I think if you get involved in all the different cultures, I think you have a better life experience. I agree. So I agree a hundred percent. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Lauren. I mean, that's all we've got for tonight. I mean, this is a horrific case. Emmett Till died a horrific murder. It's a solved case. We know who did it because they admitted it. Unfortunately, this is a situation where the justice system was biased and just didn't work at the time. It didn't work for certain people. And it's a very unfortunate situation. But I think Mamie did one hell of a job of turning this around and making things better for so many other people. I agree. I agree. That's what you always say. Something good comes from something bad. That's Oh, I know. That's why that's why try I try to- and find something good in everything and I think mm-hmm. uh, like you said, it was a horrific thing that happened, but I it propelled us forward and we still need to be propelled forward in my personal opinion. I mean, I don't know what it's going to take, but I I just love everyone and I want everyone to love everyone. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it takes growth. And remember, it, 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 the, the hatred is Except small Chris groups. Watts. Yeah. I don't love him. Yeah, I don't love Chris Ross either. Fuck that guy. <laughs> but it, it takes, you know, small, it's baby steps. It's baby steps. And so hopefully at some point in life, you know, it, it's never an issue. So I think that's going to be it for tonight, everyone. All right. So again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. Check out our website for links to all of our social media, Patreon, merch store, and more. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And as always, thank you so much for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.